Hello and welcome to Dragon Bites, the paediatric podcast aimed at paediatric trainees or anyone interested in child health. I'm Asim, one of the paediatric trainees here in Wales and one of the presenters for Dragon Bites. This week, Stacey Harris, one of the presenters of Dragon Bites, is joined by Laura Kelly, regional trainee representative for West Midlands, who, after starting a number of e-portfolio supportive measures locally, has been dubbed by her colleagues in the West Midlands as the Kaizen Queen. She's going to guide us through getting the most out of our e-portfolio and how to use it to make it clear to the ARCP panels just how fantastic you are. So if you're new to Kaizen or just looking for some helpful tips and tricks, Laura has the answers for you. You'll find the first half of this podcast as one of our previous episodes. This is the second half of the recording with Laura and the advice she has on Kaizen. So let's get started. Um, that's great. Um, so um, I thought, so what's been happening with me? I thought we'd move on to this bit now. What's been happening with me is, um, uh, so I'll try and keep up to date and I'll like, I'll, something will happen in a day, like a teaching session or something. And I'll like write a few notes. And so I've tried different things. I've tried like writing written notes because I actually quite like writing written notes. Um, I've tried like writing um, like almost like a brainstorming type thing. Um, and I did that during COVID actually to try and make it a little bit more time efficient. So I'd like take a picture of my learning from that teaching. Um, and then I've tried like typing loads of notes. Um, but then I come to ePortfolio and then I, you know, like the teaching finishes and you have to go home and, um, and then you've just got all these, I just end up with lots of notes and then, uh, you know, it could take, uh, you know, a long time to then put that into your ePortfolio and then I end up with like loads of drafts basically <laughs> and then it comes to me actually coming up to ARCP time and I you know spent hours then uh, actually making it seem okay um so I was wondering if you had any sort of tips for me about how to change my practice and just make it a little bit more um efficient because I just don't feel like it's going very well right now um absolutely and I think what you've described there is probably you know how 99% of um, trainees um, feel um, about kind of doing their, their e-portfolio. So you're not alone. Um, <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> um, it sounds like a support group, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah. E-portfolio anonymous. Case and counsellor. Case and counsellor as well. Isn't it? I mean, I think drafts is a really good place to start because I think the worst scenario that I sometimes hear about is people sort of getting to the end of the year, they've not even made any drafts on um, Kaizen, and, and suddenly they've got to kind of start writing um, all these, these different things and um, try and remember what they've done over the year. So definitely I think drafts is a good place to start so you kind of remember the things you've done. Um, but I think mm. checking in with them regularly um, and I think there's some people who are really good at, you know, doing maybe half an hour of portfolio every few days. I must confess, I have never been one of those people. Um, no, me either. And, and I think that probably goes for most trainees. Um, so, you know, I think sort of doing what works with you to kind of make you sort of check them in regularly. So, um, you know, I think whether that's in your department, um, you know, you sh- um, the Royal College um, Trainees Charter that the Trainees Committee sort of um, has created in, over the last couple of years to sort of say what we expect trainees to receive um, in their training. And we sort of say that the absolute minimum standard um, is that everyone should have four hours a month within their work schedule, within work time, to be doing activities like ePortfolio and audit. Um, so you know, if you if you're in a, in a, that sort, you can use to say actually this should be part of my rate, this should be part of my work schedule. Um, and so actually, then if you've got that regular time to just check in, you can complete those drafts and kind of send them off. Um, I think also um, another thing that um, I use a lot, and I think that's because I don't know if it's just the West Midlands and hospitals here or if it's nationwide, but I, I swear the walls and hospitals kind of 
absorb Wi-Fi and prevent Wi-Fi from kind of reaching the depths of the hospital. Um, but, you know, trying to... No, it's here too. Okay. It's the same in Wales. <laughs> same everywhere. I thought that might be the case. Um, so I use offline mode a lot on my phone um, so that you can kind of um, do a, um, a log um, on your phone and then when you do have some internet it will upload. Um, so I've written many a log whilst on hold to a tertiary specialty or waiting for everyone to turn up to hand over. And I think that's the thing as well. On the phone to a tertiary specialist, it's time to do your portfolio. Yes, like all that, all that wasted time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is what you can be doing with it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, I, sort of, you know, it, it, trying to kind of make use of those sort of dead, dead spaces in your day. Um, and I think you know, it's definitely become acceptable um, if you're in a, a teaching session, even more so now that we're, you know, pretty much all being taught on Zoom or Teams to have kind of open and jot in your notes sort of there and then on your phone. I think also mm. one of the things as well as kind of the length of what you write on ePortfolio, and I know for some people writing sort of a really long piece is actually part of the learning process for them. But actually I don't think um, you know writing thousands of words what the ePortfolio is really about. It's more about creating a log of your learning, not actually the place for the learning to necessarily be happening. So you can do what I call micro-logging. Um, and this is something that I, a lot of, sort of seniors in the RCPCH kind of prefer, whereby if you've got like a large event or a large kind of learning opportunity, you just break it down into sort of different key parts. Um, so perhaps a big event happens that's really instrumental to your learning. You can do a little reflection on one part of it. You can maybe do like a clinical question on another part of it and so on. And just kind of breaking it down into smaller chunks. Um, and then also that gets around the issue of working out which thing to tag to. Because actually you could tag the reflection to that particular key capability over there. You could tag your clinical question to that other key capability and so on and so forth. So I think it's okay to kind of put quite sort of summarised, bullet pointy sort of type things on um, on Kaizen um, and have kind of the longer sort of learning, the larger sets of notes on in kind of in your own space, in your notepad, on your phone, sort of whatever. Um, I think that can help too. Um, often when I show people my e-portfolio, um, I don't think my e-portfolio is particularly a great e-portfolio or necessarily how it should be done. But one of the comments that I can get from people is, I don't write much on my e-portfolio. Um, and actually that saves a lot of time as well because it's actually about just summarising your learning and kind of creating like a little list of what, you know, what happened, why was that important, what am I going to do with that now? Mm. Yeah, I think that is one of the things that I need to change is just just think, what did I learn from this? Not having, not writing uh, notes about it. Yeah, um, that's something I'm definitely going to take forward from this. Um, great. Um, so uh, we were talking earlier about uh, preparing for our ARCP and um, not necessarily with progress now. Um, but previously I've been caught out in ARCP where um, I don't think it was particularly obvious to the ARCP panel that I'd done certain things. I hadn't really made it very, I, I, for one reason or another, hadn't really made it very clear to them what I had, what I had done. Um, so I was wondering if you had any sort of tips or advice about um, preparing for ARCP and making almost like making it easy for the ARCP panel so that they go, yep, 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 and you're done, you know? Well, you have come to the right region to ask that question because <laughs> amongst us uh, RCPCH trainee committee reps, it is a long standing sort of joke um, that in the West Midlands we got around this issue by creating an ARCP checklist. And there are some people that don't like the idea of a checklist. You know, um, the idea that you are sort of ticking off things as you go to make sure you've done it. But I would say the proof in the pudding is exactly what you've just said, is um, this issue of kind of things not being obvious or an ARCP panel go, 
going in and you can't find that. Um, and what we saw in the West Midlands is we had a really high rate of outcome fives at ARCD, which is you know worst outcome it's been. We couldn't really make a decision because we couldn't find this certificate or, or whatever. Um, and it's just a bit of a non-ARCP. Um, and when we introduced our ARCP checklist, there was a massive reduction in the number of outcome fives. Um, and so I'd say to anyone listening to this podcast, um, you know, this isn't some mystical um, sort of checklist. You can go to our trainee website that we have in the West Midlands, www.westmidlandspediatrics.com, um, and you can go to our website and you can see a copy of our ARCP checklist. You can download it. You could even, you know, um, there's a Word document version there as well, so you could download it, edit it, and make it into your own, I don't know, way old ARCP checklist. <laughs> um, and essentially, all it really is, is kind of formalising the kind of assessment table that the RCPCH have on their website. So there's nothing in it that's any different from what the RCPCH says. Um, and then it's just got some things that are specific. Um, for us, um, it's obviously, you know, depending on which nation you're in, you'll have a different education body. We've got HEE. So HEE um, have some particular surveys that they like us to undertake. So we have those on the checklist as well, just to remind training of like, things people have done this survey. Um, it also just has reminders of like just checking off. So you're in level two, you're meant to do this many docs, so like to tick off if you've done that. And then what generally happens is trainees kind of use that to sort of check off what they've been doing over the year. Oh, you know, I haven't done my ACAT yet, must do that. So it's kind of a prompt. And then also you show it to your educational supervisor at the end of the year. So you can both go through together and be assured that, yeah, you have got all the things that you want. And so it's got reminders like make sure your life support's up to date, make sure that the right certificate is on your portfolio and um, make sure you've created like a folder in your document section that's specifically for this academic year ARCP with all the relevant certificates in it um, and so that's kind of just really helpful having that prompt because I think there are lots of little things to remember we're all really busy um, and having to remember oh must I move my life support certificates um, or will they be able to find my level three safeguarding um, so we just have our checklist, um, and I'm personally a big fan of it, and I think the reduction in the number of outcome fives, um, and also I'm quite proud to say that in the West Midlands we have a very high rate of outcome ones, um, so I think it works, I'm a big fan of having the RCP checklist, I think it just makes life easier. So what I was saying is, um, it would almost be like, uh, if you had your ARCP checklist, um, on on your dashboard and then you could um almost link from that to your so you go through that to your e-portfolio that would be um yeah good, I think. so like for us it's just like a pdf or a word document whatever you want to use it as most people use it as a word document because it's been really useful actually it's come into its own with covid because you can kind of put comments in for the arcp panel particularly now that we've moved away in most places from face-to-face ARCPs. So you can put comments in. So if something, so like take for example, um, a couple of years ago, we used to have this survey that um, we had to do in West Midlands called the Jest survey. And for some unknown reason, I didn't get sent the Jest survey because they mistakenly thought I was a surgical trainee that year. Um, <laughs> um, let's not go into that. Uh, <laughs> but I was then able to put comment on my ARCP checklist saying, um, just survey not completed um, due to um, issue um, with being sent access to it. Um, please see um, you know, um, email in uh, email screenshots in my um, fault in my document folder um, for sort of proof of this. Um, you know, or 
Ah, so you so you like it's almost like uh, you put it up at the end, and then it's like the the ASCP panel look at your checklist, and then they kind of yeah. get directed to different things in your um, e portfolio. Oh, I yeah. see. So it's like for you and for them. So um, and so yeah, you can like so sort of like almost like write to your them. working document um, over the year, yeah. and lots of people do it differently. So I I love colours, but I'm very much a visual person, so I start off with the year with all the different requirements highlighted in red. And then when I'm sort of, say I needed to do um, one safeguarding CBD that year. Um, once I've sent the, like, the ticket to whoever, it goes amber. Um, and then once it's been completed, sent back from them, then I highlight it in green. So I get to the point at the end of the year where everything's highlighted green. So I know I've done it all. That is amazing. And it's yeah. like, you actually feel like you're getting somewhere as well. It's quite, you know, I'm quite, I, I think I'm a bit of a list person too. And like that ticking yeah. is actually quite and um, sort of therapeutic, way, isn't it? And then at the end, ah, it, okay. then you kind of upload that into your documents folder. Um, and what you can also use it for is at the end, it asks you to kind of have a discussion with your educational supervisor about what outcome they think you should get at ARCP. And I think that's something that perhaps isn't always done. Where it is done, I think it's really useful because actually it hopefully prevents someone going into an ARCP getting an adverse outcome and no one's ever kind of discussed it or thought about whether they would get an adverse outcome. Because um, I think oh, you know, a lot of the senior mm -hmm. educational say you know, no ARCP outcome should ever be a surprise. But I think sometimes it can be a surprise and someone can get an outcome two or an outcome three um, and think, well, I wasn't expecting that and it's really upsetting. So I think if, you can, if your educational supervisor can have already mm. preempted if there's going to be any issues, which is what you know they should be doing, but I think for us it just really kind of cements that discussion. Yeah, it definitely makes it direct, doesn't it? I think it's a really good idea, to be honest because um, I have been surprised before um, but yeah it just makes it really yeah really obvious doesn't it that that should be discussed yeah I just uh, definitely recommend having a look at our training website and uh, you know even, even yeah, well, I'll put it on the um, I'll put it on our kind of on our website for uh, a yeah. link to this podcast actually, um, because there's a few things that have come up, so we'll have like a bit of a um, a list of resources. We we are we yeah. have to put like a PDF up, so um, I'll add that to it. Um, so you mentioned about documents, so mine are a bit of a mess, and I don't think I'd even be able to find like what was in my document. Uh, do you have any tips on how to manage your documents? So better? How um, we've always been expected to do it in the West Midlands, and I think it's quite a good way that each year, so each like um, academic year, you sort of start a um, folder for that year. So um, for me, last September when I started my out of programme, I just, the first time that year, I logged on to Kaiser and I created a folder that was UMP 2019-2020. And then everything I do over this year, document-wise, goes into that folder. Um, and within that, um, I tend to then use subfolders, so it's really, really obvious to the ARCP panel where they're going to find stuff. So um, within my, so obviously this year, because I've been UP, I haven't had the kind of normal ARCP requirements, um, but I still want to prove that I'm up to date with my life support. So within my UP folder, I have a subfolder that is literally titled Life Support Certificate. Um, <laughs> and then in that, it's got my NLS, my APLS. Um, and it's Life Support Certificates and Safeguarding, and it's also got my Level 3 Safeguarding in. Um, so, um, and when you look through it, I've just, my sort of document thing, it's just one folder for each year. So when they come to that ARCP, I've got a folder that says ST1 ARCP, my ARCP panel know, okay, right, we're going in that folder. Um, and then I use really obvious titles on everything. Um, so I rename everything so, you know, they, they cannot mis mistake where the level three safeguarding certificate is because it will be in a subfolder called life support and safeguarding they'll click on that and it will be level three safeguarding 
<laughs> um, like, if someone then comes back to me and says, we can't find your level three safeguarding certificate, you know, I can quite rightfully be like, I think you need an eye test. Um, <laughs> um, and I think there's a new feature that's come in recently with documents. So you can move folders. So I have, so rather than kind of re-uploading things, the for my ST4 year, I had my life support and safe, safeguarding certificate subfolder. And I just literally moved that subfolder from ST4 into my UP folder. So it takes two seconds, you haven't got to like refine the files and re-upload them into that folder, you just move them within Kaizen. Wow, I'm having a bit of an epiphany moment here, like, oh my goodness me, like all my ePortfolio problems have been sorted. Thank you so much, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just, yeah, uh, it just seems like, yeah, it seems obvious in retrospect, but I'm like, yeah, just carrying on being disorganized. Yeah, it's my, I'm going to have a revamp, I think. It's going to look so beautiful by the end. You know what? Like, I often think nothing in life is obvious if no one ever tells you and you never kind of came across something. Mm. Um, so, you know, this was something that in the West Midlands we were always sort of explicitly told, like, create a new folder um, every year that's like ST1 ARCP and put your stuff for that year's ARCP in it. Um, but if, you know, that was never something you were explicitly asked, I don't, I don't think you'd necessarily think to do it. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's how, because um, I can't say that my own like computer hard drive looks anywhere as neat as my guys and documents. But... Yeah, well, it's interesting because I think my computer hard drive looks much better than my, yeah, so I just need to kind of like emulate that in my e-portfolio and then maybe things will be better. <laughs> <laughs> okay um, so the other thing that I've always kind of uh, found a little bit uh, I don't know a bit clunky is um like PDPs and goals like and obviously I think I think part of it is that it does change it seems to change the way it works a little bit um over the years um but how how can I make goals and PDPs work be you know work for me so you're definitely not alone there I think even even with you know my uh, my Kaizen kingdom, uh, <laughs> um, I I found it's taken me a long time to get my head around PDPs and goals. And you're right, I think sometimes part of the issue with Kaizen is because it's been in this sort of evolution over the last few years. There have been you know times, and I think it's slowing down and stabilising now, where you log on and you're like, that it wasn't like that when I last logged on. Mm. Um, but I think what I'd say is you've got your sort of PDP and then you can set goals within that. So the way I kind of had it explained to me is say part of your personal de development plan was that you wanted to um, get better um, get better with cranial ultrasound, say. Um, and so that's your overarching kind of personal development, part of your personal development plan. But obviously you don't just wake up one day and go, right, I'm going to get good at coding your ultrasound <laughs> today. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, there's going to be a few different things that you do. So, for example, you might, one of your goals might be to um, complete some online learning about cranial ultrasound. It might then be that you might have a goal that you want um, someone to supervise you doing the cranial ultrasound. And then the final part, final goal might be that you want um, someone to do a DOPS for you and um, doing cranial ultrasound. Mm -hmm. um, you might want to go on a course. That might be another goal in terms of achieving, improving your skills with cranial ultrasound. So it's kind of like thinking of what are the overarching things that you want to kind of achieve and then using the sort of sub some goals um, to kind of say, well, how am I going to get there? Mm. How do I get to oh, that makes, and so can you link the goals to your ePortfolio then? So, um, the goal ticked off, you know, can you say, yes, you know, when, can you see this stuff? Um, so, yeah, so the, what you can do is you can link, um, um, if you can link events on your um, ePortfolio to the goal to demonstrate that you met that goal. So, I mean, the cranial ultrasound um, example is a real one because that was that was one of my um, 
sort of PVPs. Um, and um, what you can then do is link the event. So the event will have a sort of tag saying, um, you know, first of all, observe how to use the scanning machine, watch cream or ultrasound technique, become independent, and then you will you can then link something. So for example, when I had on my um, PVP and one of my goals was becoming independent and carrying out cream ultrasound. I got someone to do adopts for me, carrying out cream ultrasound. Obviously tagged that dops to the relevant parts of the curriculum and then linked that dops to that element on my PDP so I can show tick off that PDP as being achieved and I can show it's been achieved because it links yeah. to a dops. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that seems loads clearer. I don't know whether it was just kept, that it kept changing and I was just getting a bit confused about what exactly was PDP and what was goal and, you know, how, how I just didn't quite get how it worked together and how you could, yeah, so that does feel a lot more clearer to me now. So the other thing that I was struggling with, so I'm doing a bit of a QA and a here, aren't I? I'm sort of trying to solve all my problems. So, as, um, so one of our key capabilities is kind of having evidence that we've supervised others, um, but other than me copying all of, because obviously I supervise foundation trainees, GP trainees. Um, and the other thing is, is even if you supervise Royal College trainees, um, you can't really link that to your e-portfolio or I couldn't when I tried last time. Um, and when I did it, I just kind of copied and pasted the um, the assessments that I'd done, just said, you know, this person did this for and then had it as a word document but I'm there must be some better way than do, of doing it than that I wasn't sure if you had any other tips about that so I think what you've described there probably is the the best way particularly when you're supervising trainees that are GP trainees or um, foundation trainees mm. um what I um did for, for this when I was trying to meet this key capability Sort of last year was something very similar to what you described but i kind of created a summary like um over this um placement um i've you know engaged in supervising trainees um both from fy gp um pediatric trainees um as evidence of this um i have completed x assessments um for others and then just to kind of make it sort of less laborious, um, I kind of kept for the um, GP and the FY um, portfolio, I have like an email folder mm. in my sort of inbox where I just keep all the tickets and all the like, you have completed this assessment thing. Yeah. Um, so if anyone ever sort of said, well, can you prove it? Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll have my folder. Here you go. <laughs> but that's probably a little bit le less labour intensive than having to kind of screenshot and maybe blank out some personal details yeah. and, and things like that. Um, so I think you're probably right that, in, you know, completing assessments and sort of showing proof of that's probably the, the best way of sort of showing kind of official supervision. Yeah. I think... The other way that can be good as well, um, for perhaps those instances where an assessment hasn't been carried out, um, is if you use your um, skills log. So on skills log, obviously most of the time you would be logging the skill that you've undertaken yourself. Oh, but you can yeah. also log a skill, you can that, skill that you've supervised. supervised. Oh my goodness me. Um, of course. So, and if you think, you know, particularly if, and even if you're like just a senior sort of paediatric SHO, think how many times you will have shown an FY or a GP training how to do capillary bloods or venipuncture, yeah. and it probably won't have been an assessment for that particular FY or GP, but you could put it in your skills log and then link that skills log to supervising others. Um, oh, why did I not think of that before? So obvious. <laughs> Okay, but that's well. the point, isn't it? In that, um, you know, we're we're stronger when we work as a team, yeah. when we discuss things with each other. Because some of these are ideas that I've got from other people, and I am shamelessly plagiarising them. In the, <laughs> um, you know, if the skills log one was, um, you know, some a more senior registrar than me told me told me that when I was sort of more junior, um, and I'm shamelessly plagiarising it because. <laughs> 
help to help my colleagues. Yeah. So, um, so it's good plagiarism. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> My new portfolio is going to be bloody amazing after this. Um, okay, so the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, um, I don't know if you know, but we've been doing some reflections podcasts. This mainly came out of me uh, always struggling with reflections and kind of, uh, yeah, not just not really getting it. So, um, and we've done um, a few uh, where we've uh, talked about different um, reflecting uh Wait, so what's it called? Styles? No, what, what's the word? I've lost the word. Models. Models, that's it. Uh, so reflection models. Um, I was wondering if you had uh, any uh, favourites for reflection. So I think you're right. Struggling with reflections is one of those things that I think a lot of the trainees um, kind of face. Um, and I kind of I like to the GMC sort of have um, guidance called the reflective practitioner um, which I often go back to because I sort of think well if the GMC recommends it you probably can't go wrong um, and um, the first um, thing they say they have this 10 tips on reflection is that reflection is personal and there is no one way to reflect so I think when someone's struggling I say it's probably not that there's an issue with you it's just you haven't yet found the way to reflect that suits you mm. so I think probably going and having a listen to that podcast would be a good idea to find out about all the different kind of versions available um I really like to keep things simple and the GMC suggests in their reflective practitioner guidance um to use the basic format which is called what so what now what and I think that's just really kind of nice and straightforward and you can kind of easily remember that in your head. It doesn't require too much kind of deep thinking about reflective practice and it just kind of allows you to really focus on well, what does this mean for me, having reflected on what happened, and so what, why is that important? And then actually having thought about well, so what, now what am I going to do with that? What am I going to change? What am I going to keep the same? What do I need to learn? So I just really like that because it's just really nice and straightforward. Mm. Um, the fact that I can remember it off the top of my head, um, I think sort of says that. Whereas, um, you know, some reflective cycles, I'd have to probably go and Google and like look, yeah. and remind myself how they work. Um, so I think, you know, Finding what works for you is really important, um, and for me, I just like keeping it really nice and simple. Yeah. Um that's um that's we've I don't think I don't know if we've uh, discussed that one in our podcast before so yeah that's really great thank you um Laura so I uh, absolutely uh, <clears throat> grilled you about ePortfolio now we've been going for an hour um and um I've asked everything that I wanted to and I've learned so much um and thank you so much for um going through all of your tips and tricks and I feel like we could talk about it for hours um yeah. but um <laughs> but it's probably we probably won't um uh, but um yeah I just wanted to thank you so much for um taking the time out to talk talk through with us really and I just wanted to say thank you to Stacey and Laura for recording that for us those have been some fantastic hints and tips there from Laura and it's more than worth going to the West Midlands Pediatric Trainee website because they've got some excellent resources there available for you. And we'll pop, pop the link and some extra resources on our website too. That's all for this week. Thank you for listening to Dragon Bites.